ship has finally Thank you so much for sharing this time with us as we examine the book, What the Bible Says to the Believer, also known as the Believer's Handbook. We wanted to start a revival here in our Bible study, so here's what I need you to do. I need you to call, text, reach out on Facebook and Instagram to everyone you know and invite them to join us right here as Pastor Banks continues to equip us with all we need to live our best life. In my closing, please allow me to leave this thought with you. Yesterday, I thought of myself as being pretty clever, so I wanted to change the world. Today, I think of myself as wise, and I'm allowing the Lord to change me. You see, if you start with you, and if you start from where you are at this present time, changing the world is an exciting idea, but allowing the Lord to change you is what makes it all possible. Thank you so much, and be blessed.
Greetings. Grace and peace be unto you through our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to our Wednesday evening Bible study, the St. John Progressive Missionary Baptist Church, where I, Reverend Bartholomew Banks, is your host. We're so delighted that you allowed us to be a part of your Wednesday night experience. I know that there's so many other places you can tune into and so many other things you can be doing. So we don't take for granted the opportunity to share with you together. God has been tremendously good to us. He is blessing us beyond what we deserve. In spite of what we're facing today, God is still good. There's a saying that says God is good and the response is all the time. All the time God is good. We thank God for his goodness. We thank him for his grace and we thank him for his mercy that continue to be demonstrated in our lives. We have so much to be thankful for. Even though we are challenged in some aspects of our lives, God has still demonstrated his faithfulness to us. And I don't know about you, but I am determined to press on to see what the end is going to be. Because I am determined that the end is going to be victorious for the children of God. Let's begin our time of gather together tonight with the word of prayer. Gracious God, our Father, how we bless your name for the opportunity to study your word together. We thank you for the faithfulness of your servants who make themselves available to share with us tonight via the internet. And Father, we ask your blessing upon our time together. We ask that you would give us clarity of thought and clarity of mind so that we can comprehend what you would have us to hear tonight. Bless us now as only you can do, and we'll be careful to give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. As you know, we are studying uh, from the book, what the Bible has to say to the believer. We're in chapter four of that book. Uh, previously, we've studied uh, what uh, your daily behavior should be as it relate to the Ten Commandments or God's ageless commandments. And then we moved on a little further to see what your daily behavior should be in terms of your daily walk. Now we're in the section that deals with your daily behavior as it relate to the world. Uh, last week, we were able to talk about you are to live as an alien or as a stranger on earth, abstaining from fleshly lust. And then we looked at the principle, you are to separate yourself from the unbelievers of the world. And tonight, what I'd like to uh, share with you uh, from the beginning is the principle, you are not to love the world nor anything in the world. And our passage of scripture that we'll use as a springboard is 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. And it reads, do not, let the, do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but from the world. That was read from the NASB version. Let me read uh, the King James Version, which is probably what you're using since that's what we typically use in the sanctuary. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Now, so the question is raised when the Bible says, do not love the world nor anything in the world. Does this mean that we're not to appreciate the beauty, the splendor and the resources of the earth and the stars of the sky? Well, in actuality, when we think about the fact that when God created man in the Garden of Eden, he said in Genesis chapter one, let us make man, let us make him in our image and in our likeness and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds and the fowl of the air, 
over every living thing that creepeth upon the earth. So is God saying, don't love the world that he made, the universe, don't world, don't love the animal kingdom, don't love the plant kingdom, no. God has given the earth and the universe to appreciate and to enjoy, to provide for our needs. Uh, as a matter of fact, God gave us responsibility to take care of his world, to take care of the natural resources that God has given to us. Even though we're not being good stewards of it, uh, we see a lot of things that's happening in our environment. Even the government uh, established an agency is called the Environmental Protection Agency. And depending on which party is in the White House, as to whether that agency is funded at a level that allows it to be successful in its job. And of course, under this current administration, it's been dismantled to a certain degree, so it is not as strong as it need to be. Uh, there are even regulations in place at the state level, at the local level, and even at the national level that protects the environment, the natural resources that God has given us stewardship over. And of course, we know that this this current administration has uh, deregulated uh, to, to the extent that our, our environment is being put in jeopardy in some regards. So that is not what God is saying because he wants us to love the world, the things that he made for us to enjoy, uh, the things that he gave us responsibility to take care of and to be good stewards over. So what does it mean? What does it mean when it says, don't love the world, neither the things that are in the world. Well, let's look at this word world and a, a definition for it that kind of helps to understand the context of the passage that we've read. Uh, first of all, the world represents the earth and the universe that are passing away. The world is corruptible and deteriorating and will eventually be destroyed. What you see will eventually be no more. Therefore, you should not become attached to the world, but instead you should not allow this world to be so comfortable to you that you become so detached that you're not ready uh, for the inevitable that will happen when all of God's children are united with him in heaven. So you need to guard against loving the world so much that you desire to stay here more than you desire to be with God. God in heaven. Paul had the, the awesome opportunity to visit the third heaven in a trance. And it was so marvelous, he said, I was caught between two opinions as to whether I would stay there or whether I would come back to be on earth and carry out the work of ministry that God had assigned to him. Of course, he would rather just go ahead and stay in heaven, but because he ha still had work to do here on earth, then he said he would uh, live for Christ here. And so that is what it is all about. Even though what we see is beautiful, this is not our home. And so we ought not live such that we think this is all there is to life because there is an afterlife. Okay, and then the world represents a system of man-made governments and societies. Some good, and some bad, none of them are perfect. So as law-abiding citizens, you should respect and be loyal to the good on earth. But on the other hand, we should reject and stand against the bad. And of course, we see that being played out in our society today, uh, the unfortunate tragedy that occurred uh, in Minneapolis, Minnesota where a police officer representing the law of the land uh, put his knee on the neck of an African-American man, Mr. George Floyd, and as a result, he lost his life. And that is not something that was unique to Mr. Floyd. That was not something that was unique to the city of Minneapolis, but that's something that's been happening uh, uh, more frequently, even in, in recent times, just so happened that uh, incident was recorded 
and the video was showed all over the world. And as a result of that, many people in the world had reached a boiling point to the point that they're saying, in essence, what the old folks used to say, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. So they began to stand up against a corrupt system that would be discriminate in how they treat the citizens of this country. People of color are treated differently by those who are supposed to serve and protect. And so as a consequence of that, you see people that are standing up against the bad, not the good, not to say that every police officer is bad and that we should disrespect those who are in authority. No, that is not the case. But the reality is there is some systemic, some systemic disparities that need to be addressed. Then that there are people that are standing against it. And so as a believer, we should not love any of the systems of man organization to the point that we attach to them more than we attach to God and heaven. In other words, there are some things that happen in the system that we should not be silent about. We should stand up and say that's wrong. Unfortunately, there are some things that are happening by people who are in high levels of government that uh, there are those that should be t speaking up and saying that's wrong, but they are being silent. And then there are others that are speaking up and suffering the consequence of by those who are in authority. For example, uh, I saw something posted on the internet uh, just the other day of an older 75 year old uh, Caucasian uh, citizen of our country who was peacefully protesting and he was pushed down by two police officers, pushed down so forcefully until he hit his head on the pavement and he was bleeding from his ears. Such a graphic picture. And those police officers that pushed him down just continued to walk as if they just pushed a piece of paper on the ground. And there was another police officer who attempted to render assistance, but others pulled him away. And so uh, as days passed by, uh, the person who was the highest level of authority in our country had the audacity to tweet uh, something that implies that this individual was, was engaged in some activity that was uh, uh, of the nature of being a spy against our country. Uh, and then there are others who are in Congress who are in the same political party refuse to comment about how horrible it is to say something like that when someone has been injured in that way exercising their constitutional right. So that's an example of not standing up for the bad aspect of our government. Uh, and then that's, that's, that's a part of the world. And then we talk about the world represents a system of evil and rebellion against God. Another definition of it was anything that is in opposition to God is part of that world system. The world is full of sinful people who are wicked, who are rebellious. It's full of people who take a stand against God himself. When it comes to the values of this world, you need to maintain a proper perspective. You should not love the sinful system of the world. So in light of the definition of the world, God is declaring that you are not to love the attachments, the man-made systems, or the sinful possessions and pleasures of this world. Instead, you are to exercise control. Now, the first thing you need to control as part of the passage that we just read, because uh, we talked about uh, love not the world, either the things that are in the world. And when we look at it from the King James perspective, let me read it again for you. And so we can break it down uh, so you can clearly understand what we're saying. He says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And then he goes on to say in verse 16, for all that is in the world, here it is, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life is not the father, but is of the world. And so here it is. We need to control some things. We need to exercise control so that we don't get into the 
habit of loving the world or the things that are in the world. Now, the first level of control is you need to control your flesh. Uh, the flesh is the seat of desires and urges. Uh, I'm not saying the urges and desires that we have are sinful in themselves. You have desires and you have urges in order to live a healthy and normal life. For example, we have a desire to eat. We have an urge to eat. We have an urge to drink. We have an urge for intimacy. All of those are natural desires that were embedded in our personality by God himself at creation. So we're not saying that the urges or the desires are evil in themselves. But lust comes in when those desires or those urges are not controlled. If they're not controlled, then the flesh goes beyond desires and began to become lust. And you've heard me give this definition before. Lust is uh, considered to be an over desire. An over desire, an over desire. You have to guard against over desires. You have to guard against lust. Uh, now, if you have a desire for food, if you have a desire for drink, uh, if you have an over desire, then perhaps you'll eat too much or you drink too much. And so you have to be careful about those desires, those, those over desires. So you have to control your flesh, you have to control those urges, you have to control those desires so that they don't become over desires. They have to be under control, all right? And then second, you need to control your eyes. Control your eyes. The eyes have to do with seeing and wanting what you see. Again, there is nothing wrong with desiring what you see if the desire is controlled. But the desire becomes wrong when you see and desire what is directly forbidden by God. You know, there are some things that God just absolutely forbids, and you should not look at that to desire. So what are the sins of the eyes? Let's look at some scriptures that helps us to get some understanding of how uh, seeing can become a position of over-desiring. Uh, the first one is the eyes, the eyes. There is a lust of the eyes for sex. Uh, look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 28. These are the words of Jesus himself. He says, but I say, anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, let's see if we can break this down. We talk about our eye seeing. If you're in a position where you're looking at a woman and you've already undressed her with your eyes, that's an over desire. That's, that's a situation where you've already committed the act according to Jesus in your heart. And so you have to be careful because uh, out of the lust of the eye comes uh, sin. And then there the lust of the eyes for all kind of evil. Matthew chapter 6 verse 23 in the NLT version says, but when your eye is bad, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actual darkness. How deep that darkness is. There comes a time when wrong seems right. And right seems wrong when we're looking at stuff from the point of allowing our eyes to be lustful. Uh, sometimes we look at it from the perspective of saying the end justifies the means. That's one of the reasons why politicians don't mind promising everybody everything because they want their vote. And then once they get into the position that they have campaigned for, they, fig they forget about the, the promises that they've made because they figure they do what is necessary to get into office, the end justifies the means. For example, we were promised that we were gonna have a wall built between us and Mexico, and that Mexico was gonna pay for the wall. And of course, we know that didn't happen. But that's one of those things where wrong seems right, and right seems wrong. You just say what is necessary to get what you want, what you see, all right? Then there is the lust of the eyes for the things of others. The lust of the eyes for the thing 
of others. Luke chapter 12, verse 15, in the New King James Version. And he said to them, take heed and be aware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possess. So let me see if I can help you to understand how looking at things with the eyes uh, through a lustful way can cause you to do what is wrong in order to obtain that. Uh, one of the graphic pictures that I saw during the peaceful protests that were happening that turned violent and destructive was people looting stores. And I saw this particular gentleman running out of Walmart with a big flat screen TV and his pants was hanging so low that he could hardly run because it was falling down. Now, his eyes saw that television and he desired it to the point that he would commit a crime in order to get it. So that's an example of your eyes not being under control. I mean, let me see if I can explain it to you another way. Have you ever gone window shopping and you looked in the window, you saw a pair of shoes that, that had your name on it or you saw a dress or you saw a piece of jewelry? Your eyes saw it, but your desire for it was under control because you didn't bust the glass, reach in and grab it and run. There are those people that will do that. And so that's what we talk about keeping the desires under control. And then there is the lust of the eyes for pleasure and possessions of the world. Ecclesiastes chapter 2 verse 10 in the New King James Version says, whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure. Those people that have all of the resources of this world sometimes engage in, in activities that are uh, considered for, from, by the rest of society to be absolutely shameful activities. But they have this desire for pleasure and for possessions to the point that they do what the writer of the Ecclesiastes says, whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. Uh, in recent history, uh, we saw a man who was very rich and he hung out with a lot of rich people, had a lot of money, had a multi-million dollar penthouse in New York that he would pay others to recruit underage females to have pleasure with them and to have them to pleasure other famous people from across the world. That's a, a picture of having the resources so that your eyes desire something and you don't keep it from it. You have to keep those desires under control. And then there is the lust of the eyes for wine, drugs, and alcoholic drinks. Let's look at uh, Proverbs chapter 23. And I'm going to commence reading with verse 29, read down through verse 31. And this is in the New King James Version. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaints? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? Okay, that's the questions. Those are the questions. Now, here's the answer. Those who linger long at the wine. Those who go in search of the mixed wine. Those who do not look on the wine when it is red. When it sparkles in the cup. When it swirls around smoothly. So, in essence, what he's saying is, those who have red eyes and those who have hangovers, and those who have all of the consequences of being overly intoxicated, those are the ones who linger long around the strong drink. I, I uh, make a practice of being very transparent, helping people that I preach to and teach to, to understand that I've not always been where I am now. So I recall uh, way back in the day, when I was a student at the University of South Florida, I was a member of the fraternity, Omega Psi Phi fraternity, and we would have parties 
on Saturday night and we didn't have much money, but we would mix up something we call Omega juice. And we get a few bottles of MD 2020, put it in a big plastic garbage can, put in some Kool-Aid and some sugar and some water and mix it up. And there were individuals who would linger around the garbage can much too long. And as a result of that, they had some red eyes. And they had some red eyes that lasted on Sunday morning. And because this person, I won't call his name, he was an organist for a particular church in Tampa. He would have to stop by the store and get some visine to try to get that redness out of his eyes so that he can look presentable when he made it to church that Sunday morning. So that's what he's saying, the lust of the eyes for wine, for drugs, and for alcoholic drinks. So who does that? Those who linger and over-desire and allow their over-desire to become a reality. Thought you'd get a chuckle out of that. But then there is the lust of the eyes for other gods. Leviticus chapter 26, verse 1. King James Version says, You shall not make idols for yourself, neither a carved image nor a sacred pillar shall you wear up for yourselves. In other words, to look upon. And so he's saying, don't allow your eyes to lust after other gods because we serve a God who is a jealous God. And so then you need to control your eyes. You need to control the flesh. You need to control the eyes. But then the third aspect of this is to control your pride. You need to control pride. Now, the passage is not saying that you should not have pride in yourself because the fact of the matter is you should have pride in yourself. You should have a strong self-image. You should have a good sense of worth. But pride is sinful when you become focused upon yourself to the neglect of others. When you become so focused on yourself to the neglect of your spouse. When you become so focused on yourself to the neglect of your family. Uh, when you become so focused on yourself to the neglect of the needy of the world. Let me see if I can illustrate the point of someone who is, who is prideful beyond what is considered healthy pride. Those individuals who are just regular ordinary citizens and they're elected to office. Uh, for example, let me illustrate it from the national level so I'll be sure that I'm not talking about anybody you know locally. Uh, for example, you have people who are elected as senators in the U.S. Senate. And when they are elected to office, they're just regular ordinary citizens who have ordinary income, who have ordinary net worth. And they're in office for years and years and years because there's no term limit in, in the U.S. Senate. And when they conclude their career, they go in broke and come out multimillionaires. So obviously, they have accumulated some wealth while they are in public office. Uh, they vote themselves raises. They vote themselves increase in wages. They vote themselves uh, good health care packages. These are the same individuals who vote against health care for underprivileged individuals in our country. These are the same individuals who refuse to vote on a national minimum wage so that people working hard trying to take care of their families can have a living wage. They're taking care of themselves, but they are taking care of themselves to the neglect of others. Let me see if I can give you another example. I saw a picture of uh, two situations contrasted on the Internet. Uh, the first one was a picture of the former president of the United States, the most recent one. I won't call his name. Uh, it was raining, and he had an umbrella that was used to protect him from the rain. He was walking with his wife. They were getting off of Air Force One. Well, this president was using the umbrella to shield the rain off of his spouse. In other words, he was sharing the umbrella with his spouse. That's the act of selflessness. But then 
that picture was contrasted with another picture of a current president. I won't call the name. But this president, it was raining. He had an umbrella. He was walking just with the umbrella on him while his wife and son were about six to eight feet behind him walking without an umbrella in the rain. Talk about pride. Pride over pride is when you are so proud of yourself to the neglect of others. And so that's not the kind of pride that God is pleased with. Pride is also sinful when you begin to feel self-sufficient, uh, completely capable of handling life yourself apart from God. I don't care how high you climb the ladder of success, you still need God. I don't care how many degrees you have on your wall, you still need God. I don't care how many votes you get to get elected into a political office, you still need God. But sadly, the prideful often feel that, that their strong self-image, their ego, their personal strengths are the basis of life, and there is little need for God, if any. They feel that they can plow through life by themselves and conquer whatever problem and circumstances that confronts them. The prideful period in others, to others in some way, whether it be in looks or whether it be in position, power, or prestige, or whether it's education or fame. They're often arrogant. They're often boastful, believing that they deserve a right to be comfortable, to be pleasurable, and to be honored by all people around them. And yet the scripture is clear. You must not love the world nor anything in the world. If you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. So there it is. You're not to love the world nor anything that is in the world. So what should your daily behavior be as it relates to the world? Well, let's move a little further in this passage. You ought to separate yourself from the unbelievers of the world. You're not to love the world or anything in the world. And then you need to move a little further. You're, you're not to be conformed to the behavior and values of this world. But you ought to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Let's look at Romans chapter 12, verse 2. It says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, the first thing this text says is that you are not to be conformed to this world. Now, the word conform comes from the root word schema, which means fashion the outward form, the appearance of something. It is the appearance that changes from day to day and year to year. The world, the very fashion and appearances of it changes. Uh, but the world is not what it seems to be. Even though the world is constantly changing, for example, we look at fashions. Fashions are changing from season to season. Uh, one of the things that I learned a long time ago is not to throw away any ties. You know, you have a period of time where a skinny tie is considered to be fashionable, and then you have a period of time in which a medium width tie is fashionable, and then you've even had the time when they call those, those breastplate, those wide ties were fashionable. Well, they go through periods, and even to the point of, of bow ties becoming fashionable. There was a time when, when I was a kid, uh, my mom made me wear bow ties. And so when I became an adult, I was happy not to have to wear a bow tie because I figured bow ties were for boys and the neckties were what men wore. So I used to love to wear neckties, even to the point that when I was a boy, I learned how to tie my own necktie. Well, guess what? Bow ties became fashionable even for considered yuppie, up and coming professionals. And my son loves to wear bow ties. And he doesn't wear the kind that you clip on. He doesn't wear the kind that you just snap on. He wears the kind that you have to tie. 
And uh, he, he refused to wear those other kinds. So I've been trying to learn how to tie a bow tie. I haven't gotten that yet, so I haven't started wearing those. So I stick with my neckties. But the point is, you see them go through different phases of fashion. What is fashionable today is not fashionable tomorrow. Uh, so that's why it is important for us to understand that we have to be careful about trying to conform to the world. Because first of all, the world is passing away. The world is not going to be here as you see it. But secondly, the world system is against everything that God stands for. But thirdly, it is not uh, what it seems to be. It seems to be lasting. It seems to be permanent and evolving. Thank God this world system is not permanent. Thank God Jesus is going to come back and put an end to this mess. I'm thankful to God that we have survived three years and I can see light at the end of the tunnel. I'm hoping that we will evolve out of this current administration and we'll have someone in the, in the White House that is sensitive to the needs of all of the people of this country rather than just a certain segment. And I'm thankful to God that he's allowed uh, circumstances to be navigated such that uh, so many people are saying they're tired of racial uh, discrimination against people of color by the police system. And so as a result of that, we're hoping to see changes in cities across this country as it relate to police policy. And so even though it seemed like for a long time, it seemed like the world system, this system of discrimination, this system of police brutality was permanent. We can see some light at the end of the tunnel now. We can see uh, people uh, stepping up and saying enough is enough. I saw on the television uh, the other day as we watched the memorial service for George Floyd, the governor, I mean the mayor of the city of Houston declared that they were implementing policy that would outlaw chokeholds and certain things that have been uh, perpetrated upon our people across the country. Uh, that's going to happen in some other places as well. I see that uh, the legislature is trying to introduce some national legislation that will make changes inevitable in all local jurisdictions. So even though it seems like the devil is having a field day, it seems like it's permanent, it seems like it's ever evolving, it just looks that way, God is still on the throne. And that's what gives us hope. That's what gives us a sense of peace in spite of going through trying times. And then the world seems to offer the best of everything, pleasure, wealth, recognition, honor, fame, happiness. You know, I know that uh, we may not necessarily want to be transparent uh, publicly at times, but sometimes in our secret closet, we wonder how it is people who don't ever go to church, people who don't ever call on the Lord, people who will order tear gas and rubber bullets and shields to be used against peaceful protesters so they can stand in front of a church and hold up a Bible that apparently they don't ever read. How is it that they can seem to have all of the, the, the pleasures and all of the, the, the trappings of the good life, and yet people who pray all the time uh, don't seem to enjoy that? Well, it, it's not what it looks like because everything you see here on planet Earth is going to pass away. But the Bible is clear when it says, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard the good things that God has in store for us, those who love him. Listen, what we will enjoy, we will enjoy for an eternity. Uh, what the world system seems to enjoy will turn into sorrow and it will be eternal sorrow. So God has his own time set and we just have to be patient and wait on him. But trust me, God has something good in store for you. But even at that, even in the midst of not having a million dollar bank account, even in the midst of not having a chauffeur driven uh, Rolls Royce, even in the midst of not having a private jet, God is still good to us. You may not have a mansion, but you have a roof over your head. You may not have a million dollars in the bank, but you've got peace of mind. You've got a relationship with God that passes all understanding. So I would rather have Jesus 
than to have all of the silver and gold in the world. So you are in a better position. So the fashion or appearance of the world is deceptive. It's deceptive. The world and the things of the world do not last. They are not permanent. They are not unending. Even the very spirit of the world has within it the seed of corruption. The seed of corruption is seen in the acts of the world and in the nature. It's a terrible spirit of selfishness. It's a terrible spirit of greed. We see it play out day in and day out. It's a terrible spirit of hatred. It's a terrible spirit of ungodliness. It's a terrible spirit of pride. It's a terrible spirit of division, of war, of suffering. It's a terrible spirit of disease and death, disorder and decay. But as believers, you must not be conformed to this world because the world and everything in it is passing away. This world system is passing away. Listen, Donald Trump is not always going to be in the White House, but God is always going to be sitting on the great white throne. Uh, Mitch McConnell is not going to always be the, the majority of leader of the Senate, but God is always going to be on the throne. And so don't be conformed to this world. Stay with the principles of God's word. And then those who use this world as not misusing it for the form of this world is passing away. And then 1 John chapter 2, verse 17, it says, And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. So listen, you're on the winning team. You're in a better position than the billionaires of this world. Because all of that stuff is just temporary. It'll pass away. I don't care how many dollars you got. You can't take none of those dollars with you on the other side. But those of us who have right relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, we have the welcome arms of God waiting on us as we transition to the other side. Okay, he says, be not conformed to this world. But then he goes on to say, secondly, you need to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, the mind refers to your inner being, your very nature the essence of who you are as a person. The Bible clearly says that you must undergo a radical change within your inner being in order to escape the world and its destiny. You have been transformed and changed inwardly. Your very nature, your heart and your mind have been changed. Well, so the question, how can you be transformed within? As simply as can be stated right here in the verse, by the renewing of your mind. Now, your mind needs to be made new. Your mind needs to be converted. Your mind needs to be changed. Your mind needs to be turned around. Your mind needs to be regenerated. Now, remember, your mind has been affected by sin. I don't care who you are. I don't care where you came from. It does not matter who your parents were. Your mind has been affected by sin because the Bible declares all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Why is that? Because we were born in sin. We were shaped in iniquity. Have you ever noticed that you don't have to teach babies how to be bad? Have you ever noticed you don't have to teach folk how to be bad? You don't have to teach them how to lie. You don't have to teach them how to steal. It's just something in our nature that will cause us to do those things that are wrong. It's because our minds have been affected by sin. Therefore, as a result of our minds having been affected by sin, we have a desperate need for our minds to be renewed. Your mind is renewed far from being perfect, but it is basically worldly. In other words, when you come into this world, uh, you have the propensity to be alienated from God because that's what sin does. And as a result, you have a propensity to do wrong things, to say wrong things, to go to wrong places, to think wrong things. And so what is necessary 
it is necessary for your mind to be renewed. Uh, when you're born into this world, it's centered on this world, its possessions and its fleshly lusts. We have an inept position of selfishness. Have you ever noticed how a child can have multiple toys in a room? They can be playing with one toy. You put another child in a room. They're not satisfied with playing with that one toy. They want the other toy from the child that just came in the room. Because there's something within our nature that causes us to be selfish. So consequently, your mind must be renewed. And it is a continual process of renewing that needs to occur. Uh, it's being renewed by the presence and the image of God, Jesus Christ, in our life. So when you receive Christ as your Lord and as your Savior, you are, number one, spiritually born again. Jesus said that, marvel not, I say unto you, you must be born again. And then you are made a new person. You are made a new person. But not only are you made a new person, but you are made a new creature. You are made a new creature. The Bible declares, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. And behold, all things are become new. Not only that, but you're given the mind of Christ. Let me read a passage of scripture that really describes that. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So when you've been born again, he gives you the mind of Christ. Christ had a mind of humility. Christ had a mind of being a servant. And then not only that, but you're changed into the image of Christ. The songwriters say every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is working on you on the inside and you're being conformed to the image of Christ. That explains how it is that you can look back over your life and see changes that have occurred for the better. There was a time when you would not be caught watching a Bible study on your phone or on your computer or on your iPad or on your tablet. As a matter of fact, you wouldn't be caught in anybody's church on Wednesday night. You would be busy watching television or busy doing something else. But because you have a relationship with Christ, Christ has been renewing your mind. He's been working on you. So now your mind is focused on things that are above and less on things that are of this world. So your mind is being renewed. So this means that there is a wonderful truth. When you receive Jesus Christ in your life, Christ changes your mind so as to focus on him and the things that are above. In addition, he stamps his image on you. Have you ever had the experience once you were saved, you attempted to go back into some of those old circles that you used to run in, uh, hang around some of those old people that you used to hang out with. Uh, you ran into somebody that you went to school with many years ago. You hadn't seen them for years, but now you are saved and God has been working on your life and they see you and they can see something different about you. That's because God has put his stamp, his seal on you. And even when you are not walking around with a big Bible under your arm, uh, proclaiming that I'm a Christian now, people can still see the difference in your life. There's something about you that is different. They can see the glory of God shining all around you. And so consequently, when you try to go back into some of those old situations and circumstances, you make those people feel uncomfortable because they are restricted in their activity because you are in their presence, because God put a stamp on you. And so as a result, you have a mind that is being centered on heavenly things rather than a mind that is centered on worldly things. You are centered on spiritual matters. Your mind and image are renewed, changed, and turned around to focus upon God. So once you receive Christ as your Savior, you should be living a transformed life. You should be walking day by day in Christ, focusing your mind more and more on God and spiritual things. 
And so here it is in <clears throat> Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 5. He says, casting down imaginations and everything, every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So it's a process that you go through. You're casting down the imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, but you're bringing into captivity the thoughts that you have that are obedient to God. And then Romans chapter 8, verse 5 and 6, in the New King James Version says, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. And it goes on to say, for to be carnal minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. There it is. That's the benefit of walking not after the flesh, but after the spirit. The benefit is life and peace. And then thirdly, the text says, prove. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove. Now that word prove means to learn, to follow, that you may prove the will of God, okay? So it says, the will of God, to learn, to follow the will of God. Now, this is certainly understandable. If your mind is not renewed and focused upon God, how can you ever learn the will of God? So you got to focus your mind on God so that you can learn the will of God, so that you can be in a position to do the will of God. How can you ever follow the will of God if you don't know the will of God? So the only conceivable way you can learn God's will is to focus and keep your mind on God and on the things of God. God's will is good. It's beneficial. It's helpful. You see, all we can see is right now. Yesterday is gone. Tomorrow is not here yet. All we can see is right now. But God does not limit himself to the now. God is in a eternal present moment. The past, the present, and the future is an eternal now with him. He can see the beginning, he can see the end, and he can see the middle all at the same time. So he knows what is good for you. So trust him. Acceptable, acceptable. Acceptable means pleasing and satisfying. Acceptable, pleasing and satisfying. Perfect, without error or mistake. Setting you free from any need, completely fulfilling your life. So let's read that passage of scripture one more time so that we can clearly understand what, what the author is trying to get us to do here. He says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. All right? So here it is. God wants us to conform to his image. And we're being transformed on a daily basis. So don't let this world cause you to be distracted from what God has designed for you. Because the truth of the matter is, God has some great things in store for us. And therefore, we are not to be conformed to the world. But we are to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. That we may prove what is a good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. And we do that, we're in a position of enjoying the benefits that God has for us. So in summary, you gain victory over the world by obeying the charge in this universe. The charge from God in this universe, he says, be not conformed to this world, 
but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. You should strive to focus your mind upon God and the things of God day by day. Don't be distracted by all of the stuff that's happening around us. Just stay focused. If you stay focused, you can continue to walk victoriously in spite of all that is happening around you. All right, so there we are. We didn't get to section five, but I think we made some good progress tonight. You are not to be conformed to the behavior and values of this world, but transformed by the renewing of your mind. Next time we'll look at you ought to dress and behave modestly. That's a good one. And, and we encourage you to come back next week and allow us to share that with you. And then we'll move into some uh, what your daily behavior should be as it relates to questionable functions and behavior. And that's going to be a good one as well. I've indicated earlier, this is the Bible's handbook for the believer. It does not just cover one aspect of our lives, but it covers all aspects of our lives. If we want to live victoriously, if we want to walk in the will of God, this is a good tool for you to use because it'll give you some scripture. It'll give you biblical foundations of what is necessary for you to be in the will of God. Uh, in other words, it'll allow you to have something to use as your decision-making process if you make decisions about what you're going to do on a daily basis. Thank you so much for being a part of our study tonight. We trust that you have been blessed. We know that if you've allowed the word of God to penetrate your heart, that you're going to be better for it because there is supernatural power in the word of God. Well, at this time, we'd like to extend an invitation to the open door of the church to give someone an opportunity to accept Christ as their personal savior. God is still in the saving business. He is still on the throne and he's concerned about our salvation even in pandemic times. God is still in the saving business. And so we'd like to give you an opportunity to, to accept Jesus Christ as your personal savior. It is not a difficult process. The Bible declares that all you have to do is believe in your heart and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus that he came, he bled, and he died on the cross paid a penalty for your sin but the third day he got up out of the grave declaring that all power is in his hand power to save you power to give you eternal life would you pray this prayer with me dear Lord Jesus we thank you for the opportunity to acknowledge that we're sinners that we were born in sin and shaped in iniquity but we thank you for knowing that you came down through 42 generations died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins and father we accept the finished work that you did on our behalf on Calvary's cross. We believe in our hearts and we confess with our mouth that you are the Christ, that you died for our sins and God raised you on the third day. We accept you as our personal savior. Thank you for saving me, amen. If you prayed that prayer, the Bible says you're saved. The next step is for you to join a Bible believing church and we invite you to be a part of the St. John family. If you'd like to join our church, please contact our office, 813-247-2345. Or if you would like to send us an email, just visit our website and we will respond to you uh, promptly and we'll reach out to you to give you some information that will help you to begin your journey of Christian development until we can come together again physically in the sanctuary. God bless you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share the word of God with you tonight. Well, it's giving time. At this time, we're going to ask that our announcer will come and explain to you, the St. John family, how you can submit your tithes and offerings. And those of you that may not be members of our church, but you would like to contribute to the work of ministry, we certainly invite you to do so as well. We know that God loves a cheerful giver. And as we've said before, if you sow into this ministry, you're sowing into fertile ground, the funds will be used for the upbuilding of God's kingdom. Please pay close attention and share your tithe and offerings with us.
we are so grateful to all those who contribute to our ministry. Your faithful giving is important as we continue to advance the kingdom of God around the globe. Here at St. John, we offer the option of online giving where your tithes and offerings and donations are securely done through our website. Simply log on to stjohnprogressive.org, click on the online giving button and follow the prompts. For assistance, call our church office at 813-247-2345. We also have the other option of mail-in tithes and offerings. Mail your donations to St. John Progressive Missionary Baptist Church, P.O. Box 75194, Tampa, Florida, 33675. Your donations are needed now more than ever, and they are the lifeline of this church. The Bible tells us in Malachi 3 and 10 to bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in my house and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you shall not have room enough to receive it. Thank you so much in advance for your support. And now back to my dad. Pastor Banks. Thank you so very much for being a part of our Bible study tonight. We trust that you have been blessed and we appreciate so very much the opportunity to share with you from the Word of God. We know that God's Word has power and the more we feast on the Word of God, the better position we're in to walk in the will of God. Let me ask that you continue to remember all of our sick and shut in in prayer, as well as our bereaved families. Uh, we certainly would like for you to call the office and get a list of those who are going through challenging times and reach out to your brothers and sisters in Christ and let them know that they're not alone, especially our senior citizens who may be isolated because of the quarantine, we ask that you would certainly reach out to them. Uh, of course, so we appreciate the opportunity to connect with you virtually. We continue to have our Zoom calls on Mondays with our young people. And our young people have been challenged to reach out to additional young people uh, in our church and beyond our church. We're, we're not limited to just the young people of our church, but we want to minister to the needs of as many young people as we possibly can. And so they've been challenged to reach out and encourage others to participate on our Zoom as we continue to connect and continue to stay engaged in the work of the kingdom. And of course, on Tuesdays and Thursdays, we have our prayer calls and we're thankful to God that we have tremendous times of prayer. Uh, this past Tuesday, our prayer call was facilitated by our young people and uh, many of them prayed uh, for specific issues or areas of concern in our nation and they did a tremendous job so we encourage you to be a part of that on Tuesdays and Thursdays and of course on tonight Wednesday nights we stream our Bible study live and we again ask you to share it follow our page uh, encourage others to follow our Facebook page as well as uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you can be notified when we go live uh, we will stream again live on Sunday, 8 o'clock and 11 o'clock. And we've got a special project that we're working on for Friday evenings. We'll give you more information on that a little later. But look forward to an announcement regarding Friday evenings. God bless you. Thank you so much for being a part of our study tonight. We continue to pray for our nation. We continue to pray for those families who have been negatively impacted as a result of the tragic situations that is happening in our country. Those who are on the forefront of our minds are those that are in the news, but there are other families that have been impacted that we're not aware of, but we pray for them as well. And we pray for justice to be done because I'm sure if justice is not done, the unrest will continue to linger for a longer period of time. So we pray for God's will to be done. 
and positive change can be made as a result of what God has allowed to happen in our country. God bless you and keep you as our prayer. Let us close. Our gracious and heavenly Father, we come into your presence with thanksgiving in our hearts to thank you for the love that you demonstrated toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And having our iniquity being paid, we're now approached the throne of grace to say thank you for all that you've done in our lives. But most of all, we thank you for salvation through the blood of Jesus. We thank you for the St. John Church. We thank you for every officer and member of our church. We thank you for every church that is open in your name. We thank you for every pastor that stands behind the sacred desk and even proclaim the gospel in a virtual age. And now, Lord, we ask your blessing upon us as we continue to represent you in a fashion that would allow us to hear you say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Bless us now, provide for our needs according to your riches and glory. And Father, we're careful to give you all the praise, all of the glory and all of the honor in Jesus' name. The grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit rest and remain with us henceforth and forever. Let us all say amen. God bless you. Have a great evening. step on already for oh, this thing is over with I'm gonna need 10 more people got a holy ghost there listen good God about it on a Monday on a Monday I can live Talk about my day. I'm on moody days up. Let me talk about my day. Look at here, look at here, look at here, look at here. On a Thursday, on a Thursday, I can read a man. I believe I called, I believe I called that last day. I'm going to call that last day. Good God Almighty, let me say this, let, let me say this. Good God Almighty.